Welcome back everybody, this is Eric and Chad here with iRight Veteran 8888. Today we got another gun gripe episode for you. Alright, now this one is a legitimate 110% died in the wool gun gripe, okay? <laughs> and we're going to be talking about random reloads, alright? And this is going to be an interesting rabbit hole to go down and uh, definitely stick with us on this. I think you'll really enjoy this one because we're going to share some really uh, helpful stories with you guys about reloaded ammunition. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about gunsmithing technology, gun technology in general, definitely check out SDI. They're a great group of people. They support gun gripes. Uh, they got some wonderful programs. They accept GI Bill. So if you're interested in higher education in the way of firearms technology, definitely check them out. They've got some wonderful programs. Okay, so let's dive into this. Um, <laughs> so recently, an acquaintance of mine... Uh, you know, had been to my house before and saw that I had some reloading presses and things like that. And they uh, they ended up asking me recently because of all of the ammo scare and, you know, ammo in, in common calibers being hard to get and everything like that. Uh, I, had, I had one of them ask me, hey, can you sell me some ammo? Can you reload me some ammo and sell it to me or whatever? And uh, I'm like, no, <laughs> no way. I mean, because the liability for one... Uh, is a pretty extreme end uh, of the situation. If something goes wrong with a piece of ammunition that you sell somebody, uh, then that becomes a liability for you and for them. Mm -hmm. But also, there are certain legal requirements as well. Uh, you actually have to be licensed uh, to manufacture ammunition mm -hmm. for sale. Uh, that's another aspect of it, and we are going to share some stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> what's license? Lots of so stories. 07, well, you've got right, it pulled so, up here. Yeah, so in 06, all right, when, you, when you apply for like a federal firearms license, there's all these different types of licenses for whatever business that you are venturing into, whether it be firearms dealing, uh, NFA dealing, uh, manufacturing, or export, import, that sort of thing. The list goes on and on and on, okay? Uh, and 06 is your ammunition manufacturing license, okay? That's what you're required to procure uh, from the federal government if you decide that you want to manufacture and sell ammunition to the general public. Um, you cannot manufacture firearms with a license to manufacture ammunition. However, if you have a manufacturing license for firearms, which is an 07, you can manufacture ammunition and sell it. I mean, like you guys have seen Daniel Defense, CMMG, all these other companies that have like their own lines of ammo, you know, and they sell firearms and stuff as well. So they either manufacture it themselves or have somebody manufacture it and they distribute it. Yeah, and put their name on yeah. it or whatever. So, but right. that's kind of the, the basis for this. But we were talking about it earlier and there's just so many instances where like people have hated our guts. It's like, why can't you sell me some ammo? I mean, why can't you make me some of that really good match stuff? Yeah. You know, like I can't, I'm sorry. They just don't understand, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's it's a slippery slope, but primarily is the safety aspect oh, yeah. of it. And what I would really strongly suggest to people that are watching this video, if you're new to hand loading your own ammunition or new to reloading, there's several videos all over YouTube, including on our channel, that go into some of the niceties mm -hmm. of you know how it's done and what to do. Um, it's important to remember that you know when you look at a firearm that you pull out of the box brand new, and if you actually read that <laughs> instruction manual. <laughs> that comes with the firearm. <laughs> now, I know you guys know how to read. Yes, <laughs> there is an instruction manual, and yes, it teaches you about things you need to know about your gun, but almost every single firearms instruction manual is gonna have a little segment in there that mentions fa uh, reloaded ammunition or non-factory ammunition, and that it voids a warranty, or that they highly mm -hmm. you know, recommend that you do not use reloaded ammunition. It's not because they feel that you know, people reloading their own ammo or incompetent or anything like that. But it's the the problem is you the the problem is some people are incompetent. <laughs> well, I mean, the the bottom line is you don't know what is going into that yeah. ammunition. You don't know the quality of the components. You don't know if they overcharge the case. You don't know if the primers are seated in there backwards. You don't know if they use uh, brass that's been reloaded thirty times and it's about to fail. Mm -hmm. You don't know if they use the wrong bullet. Or, 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 or the wrong seating depth, or they've created a, an abnormal overall length that it's gonna provide an abnormal chamber pressure, or it's not gonna fit the magazine or work properly. Mm -hmm. So there's all these factors that go into your finished product with your reloaded ammo. The quality of the crimp, you know, what type of crimp you use, all those things are gonna matter, right? And that's why most manufacturers recommend you don't use reloaded ammo because if you go to a random gun show and some guy is selling 100 round paper bags of random ammo and you have no idea what the origin of that ammunition is, 
you have no way to know what the quality of that ammo is. Mm -hmm. If you go home and you just open up a 50 cal ammo can and dump all your nine mil that weighs 115 grains, that's brass case, into a can, all right, the round that blew your gun up, okay, was it the round you bought at the gun show? Was it the round that Jim Bob down the road loaded for you with mm -hmm. range trash you picked up off the floor? And the, You know, mm -hmm. there's no telling what in the heck goes into that ammo versus a reputable ammunition manufacturer is typically, unless otherwise noted, going to use brand new components and they're going to have a track record uh, for quality. Oh, know? yeah. Well, that's what it comes down to is quality control because ammunition manufacturers are, they, you know, they have to follow like SAMI standards. Like SAMI is the entity that dictates chamber size, you know, case size, dimensions, all this kind of stuff, maximum operating pressures, the whole nine yards, um, barrel twists, whatever, okay? But the ammunition manufacturers have to follow those standards too. I mean, so the dyes that they use, eventually they wear out. I mean, some of these like carbide dyes and stuff that they use, they can last 100,000 rounds. But for a manufacturer, I mean, that's a pretty quick turnover because these, these manufacturers are pumping out tens of thousands of rounds of ammo a day if not more than that in some cases. Um, but they have very strict standards on checking their equipment, their components, everything else. And what you get, you have an iota of like a hundredth of a percent chance that you're going to have a bad round in there. But like, for example, we've shot all kinds of ammunition over the years. I mean, we've shot tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, if not more than that. Okay. And we've had this many times where we can maybe document that you know, we had an issue with factory ammunition. Yeah. And, you know, once or twice where we've had like squib loads and things like that. It's uh, one, one time with Barry, we had a squib load and we caught it on film. Um, and we've had some just random issues with uh, lots of ammo that may have had some moisture, uh, you know, get into the, the boxes or the ammo can or whatever. And that's something too. If you're buying a random lot of ammo, you don't know what conditions it was stored in. You have no idea how old it is. You don't mm. even know what weight projectiles in there what powder it was loaded with unless you pull the the components apart and inspect them yourself you have right. no way of telling and um uh, yeah there's people like <laughs> so john frequents one of the local ranges and there was a guy in this there. is a good one <laughs> there was a it's guy a bad, it's a bad one but a good one <laughs> so he blew up an ar first right all right so this guy Tell went me. this guy went to a uh, gun show and bought some 556 five, ammo you know of course like random reloads or whatever and I, oh, I hate to use the term reload. Reloads. Random reloads. I mean, that's what that's what prompted this video. He went and bought some random reloads, and uh, proceeded to go into the local range and shoot his AR. And a couple of rounds in, his AR blew up. Blew up. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that everybody at the range could determine was that it was a faulty ammunition. Of course, that's usually going to be the culprit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking jettisoning the mag out of the bottom. The whole nine yards. I mean, Either undercharged or overcharged. It doesn't matter. Blew it, it can up. still blow your gun. Blew up. up. Yep. Yeah. Well, guy brought in a mint condition Galil in 5.56. Now, we're not talking one of the new Galils. We're talking a an OG <laughs> original Israeli Galil proceeded to shoot the exact same ammunition. Now, now I may not be the smartest guy in the world. I may not be the uh, sharpest tool in the shed, but... You could probably surmise to guess what happened to his Galil. He blew it to smithereens with Dude. the same ammunition. Okay, there are so many situations like that, and I don't care how attractive the price point seems. Uh, I don't care, you know, uh, how good of a deal it seems like it is. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you can verify the components or maybe pull a few rounds, if you've got a bullet puller and mm -hmm. you can check them out and make sure that it's legit, you don't know what kind of condition the powder was stored in before it was loaded yeah. into the cartridge. You don't know what conditions the rounds were stored in. You don't know if the uh, primers were subjected to moisture. There are so many things like that that go into the quality of the ammo that you're going to make. And I want to make it clear here, guys. I mean, I, I reload quite a bit of my own ammo, mm -hmm. primarily a lot of the oddball military stuff that we shoot. And, and I do a lot of black cartridge or black powder cartridge reloading mm -hmm. um, just because that stuff is so expensive to buy. So I don't want to make it sound like, um, you know, your average enthusiast can't make outstanding ammo because that is simply not the case. Um, you can actually reload ammo that is far more accurate and far more consistent than anything that you can buy at the factory because if you take the time to carefully control all of the parameters of your loads, you can really fine tune a load that'll shoot phenomenal in your gun or maybe a pair of your guns 
versus, yeah, that low may not shoot exceptionally well in every single gun in that caliber you come across, but you can really tailor a load mm -hmm. that works really, really precisely for your individual needs, and that is really more of what hand-loading ammunition is about. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not talking about just churning out random range ammo. Now, you can, of course, do that. Uh, there's guys that have like a you know good solid uh, Dillon 1050 XL mm. uh, with a case feeder, bullet feeder, and you can crank out some nine mil and other pistol ammo, and you can mm. even crank out five five six. Mm. Uh, Dillon makes uh, you know trimming devices that you know have the little uh, you know vacuum, and they I mean every like they have the whole nine yards in terms of how you can you can load uh, you know a lot of rounds mm. you know on a progressive press no problem. But mm. I think that hand loading in terms of for majority of people, they're trying to really craft that that good load. Like the way we solved the issue with the uh, the D166 projectiles and the 762 by 54 that we were loading up to try to uh, recreate uh, the finish service round for the M39, and we got that that we we figured that one out. We See, found that accuracy node, and yeah. Yeah. it's all about finding the the nodes and stuff. And like Eric mentioned, you're finding the parameters that work well with your rifle. When, when a company manufactures, say, Federal, they manufacture Match King ammo, like the, the gold medal match, okay? So that line of ammunition is meant to work very, very well in a wide variety of firearms because they use a powder that's, you know, um, it, it works pretty well in a wide range of different uh, firearms. The bullet choice, uh, the jacket thickness, everything works really well. Okay, so it'll shoot pretty exceptional in just about anything. Some guns it might shoot way better than mm -hmm. others. Okay, but that's kind of the price you pay. Generally speaking, though, just about anything in 308 that we've shot that mm -hmm. ammo through, it'll Some shoot MMA. a minute or better yep. depending on the gun. I mean, we're talking scars, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Daniel Defense 308. I mean, the D4, Bolt actions, D4, all that. Yeah. All that, yeah. So all, um, all of them. But when you're when you're hand loading ammunition you can do things like we're not going to get into it in detail but you can do things like ladder tests or optimal charge weight tests and you can fine tune that load for your particular rifle and the harmonics of that barrel and the action and everything else and that's really what you're looking for i mean no bench rest record was ever set with factory ammunition not to my knowledge you right. know so these guys are hand loading precise loads that are almost identical clones of each other and that's how they get that sort of accuracy um but so so I speaking of speaking of hand loading. Yeah, like look at Tubbs. Ammo. Yeah. Because I David think Tubbs Tubb. set the world thousand yard uh record for I think what five inch group at a thousand yards uh, for ten shots. I wanna say it's been broken. I think the the, the tightest group at a thousand yards bench rest was like three and a half inches or something stupid like right. that. Maybe but, even less. But than if that. you if you got a bench <clears throat> rest rifle to shoot a five inch group at a thousand yards for ten shots, you got something. Oh yeah. That's so, that's shooting. So a neighbor of mine, uh, he hunts a lot, and that's really about all he does. Um, but he's got like this uh, 300, like Psalm, like short action ultra magnum, you know, rifle, and he'll go out west and, and shoot like big critters and stuff. Okay, and uh, he inquired about hand loading some ammunition for him, and I told him that yeah, we could get together, and um, I could take his rifle, take some measurements and things, you know, uh, measure the throat depth and everything where the rifling starts to get a seating depth and and all, take some notes and do an optimal charge weight test with him. We'd go out, I'd let him shoot and get some data and then we'd figure out a load for him and then he could buy the components and I would and help him load it up. And he could sit with me and I would load it and it's like he's buying the components, I load it for free and I give it to him. You know, he sees everything that goes into it and like I'm very, very meticulous when I load rifle ammunition. Yeah. Like I load it in 50 round batches. I check my charge weight every like 25 shots just to make sure that it's still, you know, throwing like it needs to. So if I get some weird anomaly, like at the end uh, of a 25 round segment, like I'm throwing like three or four tenths of a grain over what I should be. I'm like, okay, well I go back and I just dump all those out and figure out what the problem was. Yeah. But not everybody who you know makes brown bag ammo follows those same strict standards. They might be out there in the loading shop drinking, getting crazy or whatever, yeah. watching TV, not paying attention, and they wind up with a case that has no powder. They wind up with a case that, like especially in pistol calibers, uh, could be overcharged twice. It could be double charged because with Typical rifle rounds, you're not going to get a double charge. You're usually going to have an undercharge or no powder in it. And that's where your squibs come in. And then when you figure out the issues going on, it's like, man, my gun jammed. And you can load another round in there. That's when you get kaboom. Yeah, projectile, you know, you know flew that far into the lead just enough for you to chamber another one behind it. And that's probably what kaboomed the AR and the Galil probably. with that brown bag ammo. All right, so there's a few outliers in Chad's uh, discussion that I want to add to. 
One is that, you know, if a friend of yours wants to make some ammo, say they want something really accurate like he's talking about or a specific type of load, uh, it's okay to be like, hey, here's the load. Uh, you know, I figured out, I did all, you know, did all the uh, the data and everything, and I figured it out. And then give them that load and let them make that ammo. Mm -hmm. No big deal, whatever, right? <clears throat> um, you know, the other the other kind of outlier there too is that it's important to double check and triple check your charge weights, Absolutely. especially once you find those accuracy nodes and rifles that are a little bit towards the upper end of the charge spectrum, uh, where that extra two or three tenths of a grain of powder. Uh, it, it may not be dangerous, but it's certainly outside of the accuracy node. Mm -hmm. And because you are on the top end, you <clears> want to <throat> make sure that you're not throwing anything too heinously crazy when you are working within the top end of an accuracy nodes in terms of powder. With the uh, D166 projectiles and the 54R, we learned that the uppermost accuracy node is what it took to mm -hmm. get the velocity uh, that the Finns used in that cartridge during World War II and found the best accuracy, mm -hmm. and that charge was actually higher than what Lapua even listed with that bullet with the uh, Vitavori M140 powder anyway. So we actually mm -hmm. had to exceed uh, the listed, uh, uh, the yeah, listed maximum. Yep. So and that it, happens a lot because the load data is <laughs> fairly conservative for liability. Everything right. goes back to liability all the time. I mean, that's why some manufacturers put the instruction manual on the firearms now, right? Yeah, yeah. the lawyer <laughs> banner, read the instructions, yeah. dummy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the, the low data that you find out there is very, very conservative. And if you know what you're doing, you can go slightly above that and you check for pressure signs. And some folks even have devices that can, you know, actually test for pressure. You know, they have uh, one company, it's called Pressure Trace. They make this little, you know, little dealio that hooks to your computer and it has these little strain gauges on it. You put it on your chamber. Uh, you know, the top of your receiver, we're above your chamber, and it will actually give you a reading of the chamber pressure, which yeah. is like getting way down the rabbit hole. But this is the kind of stuff that people who are really serious about this do. Oh, yeah. And this is the kind of stuff that manufacturers do to keep you safe. So, guys, the, the lesson of today's gun gripe is always be wary of random reloads. Don't, don't trust them. Uh, I don't care how cheap they might seem. Uh, it's usually going to end in disaster. There's what are a reason, you buying? There's a reason that the ammo is cheap, okay? <laughs> so we'll go way back to the beginning of the rabbit hole in terms of Chad's pressure test comment he made. And I'll just add that the firearm usually will warn you if something's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay? Always, always, always use the pressure signs that are there at your disposal to help you determine what's going on with your gun, okay? Mm -hmm. If you shoot a bolt action round and that bolt acts like it's hard to lift, on like especially on a modern bolt gun like a, a, a Remington 700 or Winchester Model 70 and that mm -hmm. bolt's hard to lift, eh, you're getting some pressure, okay? Mm -hmm. So the gun will always warn you, you know, look at the pressure signs on the rear of the case. You'll see, you know, primer uh, cratering and blowout and those, those primers will flatten really bad. Uh, sometimes you'll start to get some case head separation developing. All of those things are warnings that, hey, the gun is going, whew, hang on. <laughs> like, I could handle a round, but I don't know about that. Like, you're, you're giving them a little bit too much to drink, okay, yeah. at the bar. I don't do that again, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, you know, it, it's, it's trying to warn you, okay. Uh, there are many, many things like that, okay. Yep. Uh, if you shoot a, a round in a pistol and it sticks in the chamber and doesn't extract, that round's probably hot, okay? And mm -hmm. you can always tell by looking at the extractor uh, groove where the extractor grabs the cartridge. You know, you'll usually see some blowout. Mm -hmm. If you're running a really hot load and a Glock, Glocks don't have a fully supported uh, chamber, okay? And you'll get that, what they call glocking of the brass. Mm -hmm. so you get a little bit of a bulge. If you're getting those bulges with your hand loads, guys, scale off a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. You're probably a little bit hot on the charge, okay? So there are ways that you can know you know, if your gun is trying to warn you uh, that the ammunition that you're shooting is a little bit too hot and that you've got, you know, a little bit too much pressure. Because pressure is the name of the game. Yep. Uh, it, it's definitely one of those things you have to consider. So, guys, yeah, random reloads, no good. Don't, uh, don't do it. Don't buy the brown bag reloads. I know it's tempting, but unless you know the guy making the ammo really, really well and you know that he's on the up and up, I uh, I would not recommend it. I'd, I'd recommend sticking to factory reloaded yep. ammo from a good uh, you know a good reputable source. Yep. So one thing we didn't even mention is not only like buying like you know like back alley reloads, okay, but also like if you have members of your family that are older and they pass away, 
and they had a bunch of reloading stuff and they had random lots of ammunition, unless there's detailed notes on what that ammunition is, you can't trust it, you know? So and the best thing to do just for safety goes is to pull all that, you know, ammunition, separate the components and then just reuse the components, you know, at a later time. Um, but yep. you know, that happens a lot. I mean, you know, enthusiasts and collectors and stuff, they get older, they pass away and they leave their, you know, they leave their collections and, and all their tools and stuff to, you know, those of us and their families that are interested in the hobby. That's and, right. Um, but yeah, just be safe, guys. Just use your brains and, and really think about things. That, that's know? an excellent point. One thing that I'll add to that too is that uh, always be wary. Like if you've had someone in the family pass away and they leave a bunch of stuff behind, always, always be wary, especially of 4570 ammunition. Oh, absolutely. Because okay? not all 4570 ammo is created the same and not all the rifles are created the same, okay? This is just kind of a quick safety thing. You know, if, if, uh, if your grandfather passes away and leaves you a trap door, uh, guys, don't put a Ruger number one load in it, okay? Not good, Boom. okay? If you find Grandpa's Ruger number one box, don't take that 4570 round out of there and put it in that trap door. It's gonna, it's gonna explode and ate it, okay? Uh, and likewise, you need to know if something's a black powder load versus smokeless. So mm -hmm. there's all those little things we could go on about it, but just know that, that reloading in general is a uh, art form that is meant to be taken seriously mm -hmm. and with great care. And it can certainly be very rewarding, and especially for hunting. Oh, absolutely. When you drop that first animal with a load that you made yourself, it is a very gratifying experience, especially when you cast bullets. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, like the Kamalotter, you know, I've got my 1857 Kamalotter back here. And a lot of people think, you know, oh, it's a cool old gun, but uh, it's not just for looks. I used it on a hunt, and I, I uh, you know, made the projectile. It's just such a neat feeling to know that, you know, I, ca I took my time, I casted that projectile mm -hmm. myself, and took all the time to learn to shoot it really well, and I was able to mm -hmm. humanely harvest uh, not, not, not one, but two deer with that mm -hmm. particular rifle. So uh, it is rewarding. Hand loading and, and reloading in general is a very rewarding mm -hmm. thing that can bring you a lot of fun. It's also a great way to keep the family interested in shooting. If you've got youngsters that are interested in learning about uh, firearms technology, it is such a great way for them to understand the ins and outs of what goes into ammunition, and it's a great way to bond with your uh, with your children. You know, of course, obviously, it goes without saying. You follow all proper safety protocol. I pro always. You know, making sure that there's no flames or smoke nearby. Making sure that you're you know following every available safety protocol. But as long as that's done, uh, it's very rewarding. Just uh, keep that in mind and. Don't buy the brown bag reloads, okay? <laughs> That's the moral of this story. Back alley reloads. That's right. <laughs> guys, have a great day. We really want to take a moment to thank all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for supporting our channel. Those of you who buy t-shirts over on Ballistic Inc., you guys are amazing. We've had some really, really nice t-shirt mm -hmm. runs. Thank you guys so much for the support. We've also got some really great man cans for sale. Uh, they are custom boxes of great gear that we use that we put together just for you. Uh, if you see one of those boxes that you like, pick one up. All the funds we earn off those go right back into supporting the channel. So thank you guys very much. Many more videos on the way, and we'll see you next time. See you guys. We're going to go buy some back alley reloads. Let's go.